I am really excited to be here to talk about this because it's one of my favorite things to talk about with my friends generally, and so I'm excited to be able to share it with you tonight, and that is how to PM yourself. And the way that we're going to go about doing this, talking about this, play a little bit about myself, and then we're going to dive into the three areas of product management that I think you can really apply to your life. Uh, you can think of it sort of like product life fit, like product market fit. Uh, and those three areas are strategy, tactics, and execution. And once we've talked about each of those three areas, um, we'll recap them all with some takeaways. My hope is that I leave each of you today with some actionable items to apply to your life. Okay, so before we get into me, I want to know by show of hands, how many of you are aspiring product managers? Raise your hand. Cool, okay, that's a good number. And how many of you are already PMs? Your hands. Cool. All right. Me too. What a, what a crazy coincidence. So I am a little bit unique, I think, in that I had I'm a career PM in consumer media, and so I started out at Microsoft, where I led the mobile music team on Windows Phone. Back when it still seemed like Windows Phone, you know, it could still be a major operating system. And then I moved to a startup called Soch, which uh, is an events marketplace helped you figure out what to do in your free time, all the coolest things in the city. And then most recently, I've spent the last four years at CBS, where I drive product uh, for a whole bunch of digital media brands that CBS owns. So some examples you might have heard of would be like CNET, TV Guide, GameSpot, and within those brands, I'm responsible for product management um, for our native apps team and our personalization team. Outside of work, there's a whole bunch of passions that I have. A few I wanted to highlight briefly. I love electronic music, tennis. Don't even get me started on bridge. Uh, if you ask me about that, I'll probably bore you to death about it. Uh, travel. And most relevant to this talk tonight, self-improvement. So, I want to know, I'm curious about all of you, how many of you have set a goal for yourself or a resolution or whatever, uh, but haven't followed through on actually executing it? Yeah, that's what I, that's what I figured. Uh, me too, right? This is a problem that we all struggle with, right? This is, there's, like, there's a whole industry around self-help. What was especially confounding to me about this was that I felt like I was really good at this at work, setting a strategy and, and executing against it. And so it was really strange to me that I would be so good at something at work, but so poor at it in my personal life. And that's what led me to this question that I have up here, which is, can I apply product management principles to personal development? As you might imagine, um, I wouldn't be having this talk if I didn't think that the answer was yes. Okay, so what does that look like? We talked about three things that we're going to cover today. I want to focus first on the strategy. So what do we mean by strategy? Uh, it's used, it's one of those like corporate uh, jargon words that are overused, but by strategy I mean a plan to achieve your goals. And we're going to talk about each of those, starting with uh, what I think is the easier part, and that's goal setting. So most of you probably have set goals, as we just saw from your show of hands. You may have heard smart goals before. Um, but this part is, is not super difficult for a lot of people. But it starts with determining what they are and, and just writing them down. Even that's going to be a head start. You're going to want to make sure that each of your goals are um, measurable. And that's what I mean by determining your metrics. I'll show some examples in this bit. And then, also, this will be a theme that kind of underlies all of this talk, is around prioritization. Everything you do has got to be prioritized, and that includes the goals that you set for yourself. Okay, so the way this whole presentation is going to go, we're going to talk about some concepts, and then we're going to go over examples for each of those concepts. And specifically, we're going to talk about an example in a product context, an example in a personal development context, and then an example in a professional development context. So here we're talking about goal setting, right? 
So let's talk about it in a product context. So I mentioned that one of the apps that I'm responsible for at CBS is the CNET app. And what you see here were our goals for 2018. And there were three things that we were concentrating on. First, love. What do we mean by love? Well, we want users to enjoy using our product, right? And specifically, we were going to measure that by our app score rating. We wanted to increase the app score rating to four stars. We had a second goal around growth, right? So what do we mean by growth? Um, well, we wanted to increase our daily active users, people that come to the app every single day, by 25%. And then lastly, we also had this goal around video, and the metric that we chose for that was around video plays per session. We wanted to increase that by 50%. I also have these goals up here in priority order. Um, why did we choose this order? Well, maybe obvious and maybe not, but we really felt that having users love our product was foundational to everything, and that had to come first. Growth was the next most important thing. Uh, growth metrics tend to drive a lot of pretty much every other metric, right? Engagement, monetization, etc. And so we wanted to focus on that next. And then video, which is also really important for our business, that's why we put it third, and this wasn't quite as important as this other two. Okay, so let's talk about goal setting in a personal context. So we all have a bunch of goals, it's gonna be different for every single one of you, um, but for me, these were my three really important goals. Uh, my friends, I talk to about this time, so I take this up all the time, um, but one of them is sleep, and I spent years working on this, but the way that I measured effective sleep is eight hours of sleep per night. That's sort of the general recommended average for everybody. Your mileage may vary. For exercise, uh, the way that I was going to assess whether or not I was succeeding at that was, whether, was if I had a visible six pack. Again, what you choose for this uh, is up to you, uh, if exercise is even important to you, but this is a way to clearly see uh, whether or not um, I was meeting my exercise goals. And then lastly, around relationships. Uh, I had a pretty solid group of friends, uh, but I felt like I really could do better, and so the way I was going to measure that is not just have one friend circle, but actually three distinct friend circles. And again, similar to you know, product sense, these are listed in priority order. Um, when I sat down to think about it, I really felt that sleep was foundational to everything. Um, I feel like I'm smarter when I'm fully rested. I feel like I'm more sociable when I'm fully rested. And on the exercise front, it wasn't quite as important as sleep, um, but I definitely felt like I was way more confident um, when I was exercising as well. And so I felt like both of those would help enable the third one. Um, which is around uh, increasing the number of friendships and, and friend circles that I have. So I prioritize it this way. Okay, lastly, goal setting in a professional context. What could this look like? Well, the three examples that I chose for myself, the three goals that I chose for myself, um, the first was around product intuition. Uh, and the way that I think about product intuition, it's a little bit of a fungible term also, but as a product manager, we're always setting success criteria, right? Um, what do I think, what's the value that this project is gonna drive? Um, and if you ship that project, and then you meet that metric that you set for yourself, that means your intuition is pretty good. So I wanted to have a majority of the success criteria that I set for myself um, actually be met. Second, um, around productivity. Uh, there's a little bit of, a, of, a, of an asterisk around here, but I wanted to ship more than any other PM at the company. Uh, the reason it's an asterisk is because it's actually pretty easy to ship more than any PM the company if you're like, shipping piddly little bug, bug fixes. But I trusted myself not to sandbag this. These are going to be meaningful projects. Uh, but that's how I chose to measure productivity. And then lastly, around relationships, uh, I really wanted people to love working with me. So much so that they would demonstrate this, we could measure this by having people ask to work with me. Uh, and so that was the measure, that's how I chose to measure that role. Again, these are in priority order. I really felt that being re really good at my job uh, at an individual level, having great product intuition, being productive, those were going to help facilitate having strong relationships. And so I prioritized them this way. Okay, so those were the examples, some examples for goal setting. Again, each of these are going to be entirely personal to yourself. But the point is, once you have these goals, now it's start to it's time to start thinking about something a little bit more challenging, and that is the roadmap. 
And for roadmap, I'm kind of curious, who, there was a few people who were already PMs. How many of you have been responsible for creating a roadmap before? Cool, okay, few of you. So this is gonna be uh, pretty, fam hopefully pretty familiar with you, but it starts with a list of ideas, right? Mm -hmm. List of ideas to achieve the goal that you've outlined for yourself. Then you go again through a prioritization exercise. And most critically, this is where the timeline comes in, right? You're gonna work with your partners on engineering and maybe other stakeholders as well uh, to set a timeline for, for these various ideas. So just as we did for goal setting, let's take some examples. So in the product setting, uh, product side, you might recall me talking a little bit about love earlier, right? And the way that we're gonna measure that is app score rating, increasing app score rating to four stars. So we thought about how we were gonna achieve this we basically thought of three really critical things to do. And it was more complex than this, but I'm trying to simplify it so that it fits nicely on the slide here. But the first is we've got to make sure that we have the features that our users want and expect um, in order to make them like the app in the first place. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but at the time that we set this goal, our app score rating was actually an abysmal 1.5 stars. Um, so we definitely had a lot of work to do. Um, and a lot of that was just understanding what our users expected of us, what made an experience great for them. So we looked into that and we implemented all of these uh, highly requested features. Some months down the line, uh, and we had this plan set ahead of time, we knew that we were going to add a rating prompt as well. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, like know this, but or maybe you could just rely on your personal experience. Um, you're probably only going to rate an app if you have like extremely um, strong feelings about it, and, and usually negative feelings, right? So we had all these people that were uh, that liked our app, but they weren't saying anything about it. So we wanted to prompt them to rate. And then lastly, once we saw that was happening, people like our app, they're showing us they like our app. That's when we can reset the app score rating uh, because then and then we have an overall average that was four stars. Okay. So what's an example in a personal context? This may be more interesting to you. So this time I'm gonna work backwards here. So you might recall the sleep goal that I had set for myself earlier, right? And the way that we're measuring that is by getting eight hours of sleep per night. So what's a plan to achieve that goal? Well, in order to get eight hours of sleep a night, uh, you have to go to sleep earlier, right? So I set a goal or I set an uh, idea to have my <coughs> lights out be out by 10.30 p.m. But in order to get, uh, in order to be lights out at 10.30 p.m., I actually really need to be in my bed by 9.45 so that I can read, settle down, and be ready to fall asleep by 10.30. But in order to do that, I actually really need to be in my room by 9 p.m., right? Because I have to shower, I have to uh, brush my teeth, etc. So I had to work backwards, basically. And, and this is the plan that I put together for that. Then, lastly, a professional example here. Uh, we have, uh, you might recall the goal around productivity, right? Shipping more than any other PM in the company. So uh, one, of the other, one of the many things I like is alliteration. Uh, and I decided that to find my love of alliteration and my love of, of efficiency by grouping all the different type of tasks that you do as a product manager um, as closely together as I could. You basically come up with a theme for each day. Obviously, this is very difficult. As a product manager, you're being pulled in a lot of different directions, so you know, your mileage may vary if you try to employ this particular idea. Uh, but uh, I found it to be very successful because then I was less uh, randomized. My, my, my mind could focus on the particular skills that I needed to do a set of tasks. And so the way this manifested is, um, is I have, again, I have a theme for each day, right? So metrics Mondays. As a product manager, you're always thinking about um, analytics and you might, you might be doing investigations and things like that, setting up dashboards. I have Ticket Tuesdays, which is all around uh, basically helping engineering execute most effectively. And so examples uh, might include verifying tickets, uh, responding to engineers' questions, comments, things like that. Work with others Wednesdays, which is uh, basically meeting day. It's very important as a product manager. And thinking Thursdays which is where I try to do a lot of my individual work. Um, my strategic thinking, my roadmap thinking, my uh, spec work, all that stuff. And again, I try to prioritize these. Um, the one that I felt like that was gonna make the biggest 
you know, I was going to get the biggest bang for my buck uh, in terms of productivity gains was definitely around eating Thursdays, and so I put that one first uh, and tried to like really like treat that day as sacred. Uh, and then these other ones um, I added uh, incrementally as I saw some success with Thinking Thursdays. I will say, to be completely transparent, the Thinking Thursdays is still the one that is, is I'm doing the best at. Work Composed Wednesdays is also pretty good, but the Thinking Tuesdays and Metric Mondays, uh, they're, they're, a little, they're still a little flexible, and I think that that is going to be required for anybody trying to uh, take this particular idea. Uh, okay. So we've talked a little about strategy, so hopefully when you go back and apply this, you will be able to set some goals and then create a plan to achieve those goals. But there's still the matter of actually being able to do it, right? How do you, how do you employ this plan? How do you make it a reality and manifest it? And that's where the tactics come into play. So what are tactics? Again, it's kind of a corporate jargon term. Uh, but tactics, we define as methods to get your ideas, all those ideas that you would have just come up with, to get those ideas to take and become reality. So there's three that I want to talk to about today, uh, but there are many, many more. Uh, these are the three that I found to be most successful. Uh, and those are gamification, nudges, and friction adjustments. And again, we're going to talk about each of these in more detail and give you some examples. Okay, so let's talk about gamification. So uh, let's see. You're right in front of me, so I'm going to ask you, what's your favorite game? Um, FIFA. FIFA. Okay. So FIFA, um, actually I'm not super familiar. I know what it is, but does it have, uh, like, does it have levels or does it have campaigns or have, like, sort of? Sort of? Okay. So those types of things would all be examples of uh, both one and two, like leveraging the sense of completionism. Uh, that feeling as though you, you, you've completed something and reinforcing progress towards a particular goal. What FIFA definitely has in spades is this last point, which is encouraging competition. Um, and that's maybe the thing that people think of the most when they, when they think of the So all of these uh, attributes are important parts of game. So let's look at some examples. Again, let's talk about a product example first. So, one of the apps that CNET is responsible for is our Tech Today app. And Tech Today is a daily news digest, gives you the 10 most important tech stories of the day. And what we do is, when you finish those, uh, going to those 10 stories, for every story that you've actually read versus just looked at the headline, we give you a dot. And what that does is it gives you a sense of completion, it reinforces this idea of completionism. Uh, so that if you read all of these articles or most of these articles, you're allowed, you feel good about that, and you want to come back and you want to read the same or more the next day. So another example, uh, who here still uses Snapchat? Does anybody? Is that still a thing? Okay, few. All right, that's about what I expected. Uh, <laughs> so uh, one feature you probably like, or if you've used Snapchat in the past, you probably remember Snapchat streaks, right? Yeah. So. I tried to steal that idea and apply it to myself. And basically, I recorded a tally mark for every single uh, day that I met my sleep goal. And then if I did it, uh, and I'll talk about why I made the slight change, because the Snapchat streets is completely erased. Uh, but I did like a minus one if, uh, if I didn't meet it for that particular day. Uh, and so that way, you know, trying to get to in bed by 9.45 or whatever, I can, visit, I can visibly see progress that I'm making. And less incentivized to stop. Okay, let's take an example in a professional context. This one's more centered around like competition. So uh, as a product team, one of the unenviable tasks that we have is trying to keep our bug backlogs down, right? We don't want to have this proliferation of old stale bugs that aren't really important to fix anymore. Um, and so you, we call this a bug bash, um, as opposed to like an engineering bug bash. And basically we just go in and we try to close as many things as we can. Uh, it's not fun, uh, but we decided to make it as fun as we could uh, by making it a competition. So I set up a Jira dashboard where with uh, like each product manager's name and an account of the bugs that they resolve. 
And you can see this leaderboard in real time, basically. And so for this day that all of us were in the same room, basically trying to kill as many bugs as we can, we had a sense of competition. It really incentivized us to actually execute this, uh, this task. <laughs> Um, so that's how you might employ, uh, you're trying to yeah, employ a professional context. Okay, so nudges. Uh, <laughs> does anybody, uh, does anybody, does anybody have like a roommate or maybe a parent who's left you like passive aggressive post-it notes? Does have an experience? Yeah, okay, yeah. So that's like, that's an example of a nudge, for sure. It's not the, like, the most friendly example of a nudge, but it is one. Um, and they're effective, right? So nudges are highly visible reminders to take or to not take an action. So again, let's take some examples here. In a product context, uh, the CNET app that we're responsible for, we recently added this deal section over there, which basically is what it sounds like. We curate a bunch of uh, deals across the internet around electronic products. Uh, we wanted people to engage with this. And so many of you have probably seen this UX on your phone before, but we added this, uh, this uh, badge here that where the count increases every single time that a new deal comes in. <coughs> and I don't know about you, but like every time I see this, like I just want to tap it. Like, I just want to, it's just very tappable, right? Um, and it clears when it taps, and so it gives you that sense of like, uh, like oh, I like, you know, give that dopamine rush. Oh, I like check this box, I cleared it. Um, so that's an example of a known product context. So in a personal context, um, you might recall uh, the streaks thing that we were just talking about, right? Uh, for sleep, for instance. Well, I wanted to make this very visible, right? A nudge is a very visible uh, indicator of progress. And so what I did was I put it on my refrigerator, right? That's probably the most, I don't, I don't know about you, maybe, maybe you guys don't, don't get as hungry as frequently as I do, but uh, the refrigerator in my kitchen is probably the place that I go most frequently, right? Uh, and so I always see this every single time I uh, go into the kitchen, um, and it's a constant reminder of uh, the importance of these goals to me. And lastly, an example in a professional context, I put a gigantic calendar block for my Thinking Thursdays, uh, which was not just a nudge to me, but actually was a nudge to everybody around me. So it sort of had this like dual purpose benefit. Okay, last one for tactics, friction adjustments. So you probably have heard this term friction before, but this can basically take two paths, right? You can either decrease friction, i.e. make it very easy to take desired actions, or you can increase friction and make it really difficult to take undesired actions. So let's look at some examples. All right, so in a product context here, what, what would you tap on on this screen here? This is the CNET onboarding screen. Sorry, what? Yeah, yeah sign in with Facebook, or, or maybe sign in with email, right? You probably wouldn't tap, no, I'll do it later, right? Yeah, maybe you would, but I don't. <laughs> but, but that's certainly not what we would want you to do. Um, so we try to really emphasize the happy path here around sign-in. We still give you an option, of course, um, but, uh, but we try to decrease friction for the desired actions. Okay, what's an example in a personal context? Well, there's an app called App Detox. I'm an Android user. I know most of you probably iPhone users, San Francisco. Uh, I think iPhone actually does this out of the box now uh, in their settings. But on Android, I still have to use this app uh, and I'd like to think I'm a little bit hipster about it too because I did this before Apple even like introduced their like screen time feature thing. So anyway, I have this app called App Detox which blocks app usage past a particular time. Uh, and so it doesn't make it impossible, right? I can go into this app and disable the setting that I set up for myself, but it adds a whole bunch of friction, right? The default behavior is that I'm going to subscribe to the rule that I set for myself, which is don't use my phone past 9 p.m. Okay, what's well, an example in a professional context? Well, this was kind of interesting because it helps facilitate another idea. But the whole idea of work with Wednesdays in the first place is actually really valuable because it makes it, um, it reduces friction um, uh, towards achieving Thinking Thursdays, right? If I try to put all my meetings or most of my meetings 
on Wednesdays, there's less pressure to try to have meetings on other days, especially on Thursdays. Okay, so we've talked about strategy, we've got a plan, we've made some goals and you made a plan for it. We've talked about tactics, you have all these ideas now, how to bring it to reality. Um, but we still gotta talk about execution because when you go about actually doing this, things aren't gonna go smoothly. And without this piece, you're definitely not gonna ultimately achieve the goals you want. So what I mean by execution is, you know, when you're going about trying to manifest your goals, manifest this plan, uh, you need to be iteratively reflecting on and refining those strategy and tactics that we just talked about. Because unless you're a genius, whatever you thought was going to work in the beginning is probably not going to take you all the way there. At least it did for me. So I'd like to talk about reflection and refinement again in each of these three contexts. Product, personal development, and professional development. Okay. So the example in a product context is retrospectives. Uh, so for the people who are currently product managers, do uh, any of you employ retrospectives currently at your, at your place of work? Yeah? I'm seeing some nods. Okay, cool. So retrospectives, there's a variety of different ways to run this, but um, the typical way is there's three different things that you're trying to achieve. You're trying to get a sense of what went well in, in some, oops. Focus on three things. What went well for a given period of time, what went poorly, and you want to identify at least one change that you can make as a team going forward. That's the really critical part. And using retrospectives and those three things, I wanted to give you an example of a strategy change that we made as a company and a tactic change that we made as a company. So on the strategy side, I've got to give you a little bit of context first. Uh, CNN I spoke to you about the Tech Today app, and I spoke to you a little bit about the CNN app. For a while, we were doing both concurrently. We were marketing both, we were developing both, and as a consequence of that, it really made uh, us to make it difficult to make much progress on either because those efforts were fractured. <coughs> so we wanted to consolidate to just one, uh, and when we compared the old app versus the new app, um, maybe to your surprise, the old app continued to outperform across all the KPIs that you were interested in. So it's being growth and revenue and things like that. Um, and so we actually made the decision uh, to focus the development on the, old, on the old CNET app and actually redesign it, taking some of the learnings from the new app that we had had. Uh, and that was a really big strategy change for us and it came out of this retrospective analysis that we did. Okay. Tactic change. So the one that I wanted to call out here is uh, if you're a PM, the big thing you're doing is you're writing specs, right? Uh, and the number one client of your specs is probably your engineering team. And so you want to you wanna have a spec, from my perspective anyway, that's a living manifestation of your product, right? Um, but unfortunately, uh, if you're trying to do that, your specs can just grow and grow and grow as your product matures and grows. Uh, and then if you're trying to um, add a feature, it, it may not all be like neatly in one section of the spec. There may be requirements that are spread out. Um, and that makes it really hard for engineering to find what they need. And so the way that we, this came up in a retrospective, and the solution <coughs> that we decided on was to deep link to these various different uh, parts of the spec um, to make it easier for engineering to find requirements. Okay, so let's talk about personal. Uh, how could reflection and refinement be leveraged in a personal context? Well, um, I'm a huge fan of something called Five Minute Journal. Uh, there are probably a bunch of different ways. I'm actually kind of curious. Does anybody do any sort of journaling? Like, raise your hand if you have some sort of journal. One, two, oh, okay, quite a bit. Huh? You do Five Minute Journal. Oh, amazing. Okay, so this will be a little hat to you. Um, so I'm a, I'm a huge evangelist of them. They should give me like an affiliate code or something. But um, yeah, the five minute journal uh, is what it sounds like. You write five minutes a day, but it's in a very structured format. So in the morning, you write three things. Uh, you write one, three things that you're grateful for. Three things that would make today great. Those are your goals. Um, and one affirmation. So like. I am interesting, I am persuasive, I am strong-willed, things like that. And then in the evening, 
you, uh, you do two things. You say, one, uh, three things that went well in your day. And lastly, you try to identify at least one change, or one thing that you could have done better. And I find this really valuable for several reasons. But the most important reason is it keeps your goals top of your consciousness. Because the biggest struggle that I have found um, in actually manifesting um, my stra the strategies that I set for myself is that it's easy to like ration when you rationally deliberate about the, the changes or habits you want to create or break, but it's hard to actually like execute against that in the moment. And what this does is if you're writing down your goals to you know, not use your phone, or get to bed by a certain time, or whatever it may be, you write that every single day, it's going to stay top of your consciousness. Uh, and you can actually also measure success every single day too, because if what went well, the three things that went well match your three goals, then you had a great day, right? You said you did exactly what you said you were gonna do, and you can measure that on a day-to-day -day cadence. Um, and then if you're not, you'll be able to identify changes that you can make going forward. Okay. Uh, so how did that manifest in two examples? So a big strategy change, I kind of already jumped the gun a little bit about this, but uh, I was trying to get to, I was trying to get to sleep earlier, right? What I actually found was that getting to sleep earlier was impossible uh, unless I was able to break my addiction to my phone and my computer and all that stuff uh, first because, yeah, that just it basically never stopped helping. Uh, so I made that strategy change and I was like, okay, I'm gonna forget about the times for now. I need to figure out ways to not be on my phone um, past a certain time, not be on my computer past a certain time, or maybe just use it less gently. And so I put my brain on that. An example of a tactic change, I kind of already mentioned this in passing as well, uh, but initially for the streaks thing that I was talking about, I tried the Snapchat methodology. It was like, okay, you know, I have like 10 days in a row of being in school, but then I missed a day. Right? and then I wiped it all away. But in practice, that's actually really demoralizing. And then I basically just stay at zero because I'm just like, oh, like, you know, just like, just like one messed up, like basically undermines everything. I feel really bad about myself. Um, and so when I changed the system, it was just to remove one a day, and then that way I felt like I could still like, keep the momentum going even if I slipped once or twice. Okay. Now, uh, lastly, I want to talk about it in a professional context as well. So I sent a status email called 3Ps. Uh, everybody does status in different ways. This is the way I do it. Uh, but the 3Ps are progress, priorities, and problems. And ideally, if you're, if you're doing things right, uh, you, every, the progress should be exactly what you set the priorities for in the, in the week prior. Uh, it doesn't always happen, obviously. Um, and when you have that mismatch, you're able to spot that week to week. It's also really important here to note like the difference in the cadence for these things as well. Um, so uh, we did the product one at a sprint level, which is every two weeks or four weeks or whatever. Um, the personal one, uh, most of the habits that at least I was trying to change were daily habits. So I wanted this reflection to be a daily thing. And then this one uh, was more about professional growth. Um, I, I do weekly. Everybody, you're, everybody should set their own, but that was the cadence that, that I found. Uh, so, around the productivity stuff, uh, one strategy change was around this idea of thinking Thursdays generally. I observed this trend of not being, uh, like, like week after week, the things that I would set for myself that were more strategic uh, would keep getting postponed because I would keep dealing with fires or um, requests uh, that, were, that were reactive. Um, and so that's when I was like, okay, I really need to solve this and, and like treat uh, some bucket of time with, uh, you know, as sacred. And then the uh, tactic change, or example of tactic change, uh, you know, I talked about work with others Wednesdays. Um, I don't know if any of you had this thought, but it's actually pretty awkward. Like if somebody sets up a meeting for like a Thursday or whatever, and be like, oh no, I, I don't take meetings on Thursdays, right? Like how, <laughs> like how would people react to that? Uh, the answer is not usually, sometimes people are cool with it, but sometimes uh, people are like, what? Like, why? Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I, the way I saw that is just, I just try to schedule as many meetings as I can myself and just be the person scheduling the meetings. Most of the time this works out fine. And that way I just have to, I avoid that conversational. Okay, 
So we talked about a lot today, right? We talked about strategy, we talked about tactics, we talked about execution. Um, but I really want to boil all of these down into simple messages that each of you can take um, and apply to your lives. The first takeaway that we have is you can't get to your destination without a roadmap, right? You don't know where you're going, you're not going to get there. So go and create roadmap. Two, the same tactics that you use to create habits in your users will work on you. So leverage them. Right? All those things we talked about, gamification, nudges, uh, friction adjustments, and anything else that you use in, in, you know, to create better products. They'll work on you too, when you're trying to build habits. And lastly, remember that you're going to fail, and you're going to fail frequently. And that's okay, uh, because it's reflecting on those failures and adjusting course correspondingly. That is what's going to yield you success. So I have one last message for you, and that is, yeah, you are a product. Maybe you've heard that before. But even more than you being a product, even more important than you being a product is that you are the most important product that you're ever going to work on.